Turn my phone off too. Good. Okay to start. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm a little rocky today, and I've got an uncooperative cat sitting on me. But I'll do my best. Teacher, boat destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, Helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, Supreme One, Teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, Foe Destroyer, Glorious Victorious One, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, Foe Destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed. Supreme One, Teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. When you, chief of humans, were born, you took seven steps on this great earth, and you said, I am supreme in this world. To you who were wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supremely fine form, ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, Fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector, to you I prostrate. Endowed with the supreme marks, a face like the stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you, who is free from dust, matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, field of ocean-like merits and good qualities. The thus gone, I prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment, through virtue, releases from the evil gone realms, unique, supreme, ultimate meaning to the Dharma that brings peace, I prostrate. From freedom, teaching the path, 
well abiding in the pure trainings, holy field endowed with good qualities. To the Sangha also, I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma Refuge, homage to the great Sangha, to all three ever devout homage. To all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms, in all aspects, with supreme faith, I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous action. Accumulate virtue and goodness. Subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning, and clouds. Look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all-seeing, and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, may I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence, stirred by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen and may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jeweled mandala, together with other pure offerings and wealth, and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. O my masters, my yidams, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith. Accepting these out of your boundless compassion, please send forth waves of your blessings. Idam Guru Ratnam Mandalakam Nyuryati Yami. The Heart of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra, Arya Bhagavati Prajna Paramita Hridaya Sutra. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time. The Bhagavan was dwelling on Massa Vulture's Mountain, on Rajagriha, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then, through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Valakiteshvara, said this to the Venerable Shadadvati Putra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage, who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom, should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. 
Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomenon. There is no eye element, and so on, and up to and including no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared, Tayata gate gate paragate parasam gate bodhi soha. Tayata gate gate paragate parasangate budhi soha. Shariputra, the bodhisattva mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the bodhisattva mahasattva Arya Valakateshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage. It is like that. It is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the Venerable Shadadvati Putra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, Aryavala Kateshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Ashuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised. That's spoken by the Bhagavan. What's my topic today? Anybody remember? Positive. That's correct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So I'm going to try to um, keep my mask on uh, out of uh, solidarity with the people here in person, uh, and also uh, set some example. So can um, uh, people hear me like all the way in the back? Cause we're not, we don't have amplification in the gompa here. And then can people hear me uh, remotely? Yes, okay, good. Um, 
maybe uh, we can, uh, I don't know if we have to ask permission, but pan the audience a little bit and uh, we, we can see um, just that we are not at a Trump rally because we are all wearing our masks. <laughs> so we are all, we are all masked up. So uh, we're at a Dharma rally. <laughs> like that. Okay, yeah, so we can see. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So yes, I want to talk about a journey. Um, uh, in formal Dharma practice, uh, there are many uh, uh, teachings in schools and many different approaches. Um, the basic approach uh, that we take here at Lionsor is uh, we need to do uh, everything at once. Sometimes I say that's the fastest way to do everything at once. So what that means is we uh, at least have the view uh, that's uh, wide open. So the view, uh, right understanding starts with uh, doing everything at once, which means uh, we start with the highest view, uh, Mahaati, Mahasandhi, Dzogchen, down to the most foundational vehicle, um, the truth is suffering. So we start at uh, maybe the most basic uh, school, uh, the Savastavadin, the great exposition school, all the way up to Dokchen uh, and Mahamudra. So we have to actually practice, if we're doing fully, we're, we're practicing uh, from the top and we're practicing <laughs> so-called from the foundation uh, and then we're uh, uh, going toward the center like that. So it isn't uh, so much a hierarchy as um, a journey, a practice to corner the misperceived self like that. So um, it, it's more of a, a, a journey where we're uh, meant to arrive at the place where we have to confront who we are. So <clears throat> it's a, a journey to the center, but um, it's difficult to maintain both the highest view uh, and both a very conventional practical view at the same time, isn't it? But uh, particularly that's what we have to do in uh, our lives. So uh, many of the people here have had opportunity to uh, receive in person or read uh, uh, highest teachings, so to speak, most profound teachings. And uh, we sh should also have the opportunity to uh, read fundamental teachings and do uh, them at the same time. So uh, very famously, uh, Gurimshe Padmasambhava said, the view I have is as uh, vast as the sky and my activity is as fine as barley flour, like that. So his view is very fine too, obviously, you know, the, uh, the very open uh, luminous nature of awareness and uh, the very practical uh, issues of uh, food and sleep and administrating um, temples <laughs> like that, right? So uh, we all have the most profound uh, view because we are uh, inherently Buddhas, uh, but we also have uh, the practicalities of dealing with our lives, uh, the political situation, uh, the environmental situation, so forth. So we can't put off one thing, well, when I get realized, then I'll become active and at the same time, uh, so just doing uh, training uh, formally, we have to do practice at the same time, particularly when we're doing uh, 
what I like to call Mahasiddha practice, great accomplishment practice. In other words, we're accomplishing uh, both uh, absolute and conventional world at the same time. So the path is uh, meant to uh, actually uh, drive us to confront ourselves in the middle. So the best way to be is in the middle like that. <laughs> Um, I'd like to um, thank uh, Dirk for being on say today from uh, Pennsylvania. That's uh, very good. Thank you. Wonderful. <laughs> uh, all right. I'm imagining that with Dirk that even though there are probably some boxes uh, that left to be unpacked, that his book and his shrine and, and meditation seat is already in place. <laughs> no, he's <not. laughs> so, um, <clears throat> so I'm delighted uh, here today. <clears throat> so I use the term hero and heroine's journey to um, mention uh, a uh, term that became well known with the mythologist and professor um, Joseph Campbell, who wrote a very famous book, Hero with a Thousand Faces, and um, analyzed many of the uh, myths of the world through kind of a Jungian uh, perspective, anthropological uh, perspective, and came up with uh, the hero heroine's journey as uh, a primary way that people uh, uh, transform and realize themselves. <clears throat> and uh, I'm working on uh, a practice that incorporates uh, the Kala Chakra teachings with um, the hero and heroine's journey. Um, you know, I'm very glad that uh, Marie has uh, willing to take on uh, that activity. She's helped with that already and publish uh, talks that have to do with uh, my talks in general, but also called Chakra and Hero and Heroine's Journey. So um, she has to wade through a lot of uh, talks and do a lot of editing. So uh, shout out to uh, Marie for taking on that project. There, uh, there's nothing like the loneliness of uh, editing and uh, writing. Do you agree? <laughs> so, <clears throat> so we have to. Um, practice uh, both sides of the street. We are practicing both uh, absolute and uh, relative practice at the same time. In the Buddha Dharma study program, uh, I am asking people to read the foundational uh, Mahayana texts from India that uh, all the Mahayana and Vajrayana schools are familiar with uh, and that also have some different interpretations of. Um, if we had more time, of course, I would ask you to read some of the uh, foundational treatises also, uh, traditionally called like Hinayana, but um, not Hinayana in the sense of lower, but Hinayana in the sense of individual liberation. When we completed the uh, Shastra and texts from Mahayana, then we will be doing um, the next module, which is on uh, meditation using meditation manuals. Um, one manual people are already aware of is uh, the Shamatha book that I invariably recommend called Calming the Mind, right? <clears throat> well, you might have to read that again um, for the next module for those. But for those who have been using already, it'd be easy, right? <laughs> uh, and, uh, I have some manuals uh, that are quite impressive and difficult. Um, somebody, I can't remember who right away, but said, oh, uh, can, uh, I'd like, to, can I have permission to read Moonbeams of Mahamudra? <laughs> and I said, okay, you can do it. And then they, uh, they went, whoa, that's, that's intense, right? I've got Tashi Namdel's like Moondooms of Mahamudra, right? Um, that would be like uh, uh, something we, we could read and, and shorter texts um, <clears throat> that have to do with retreats. So 
the same time that we're reading uh, difficult philosophical shastras, particularly as we go into Dignaga and Dharmakirti, then uh, we also have to be uh, looking forward to reading the meditation manuals, don't we? You're not going to find this in another Dharma study program. I guarantee it. And then uh, by combining the meditative practice with the scholarly practice and our, our close personal relationships, uh, then actually we can have some interesting debates, don't you think? I know uh, Elizabeth Zima is looking forward to some strong debates, aren't you? It's true. Yeah. So <clears throat> uh, it's very difficult to do the classical uh, debates um, in the monasteries because um, whether it's Giluk or Kargu or Nyingma, because it's dependent upon memorizing texts, which uh, is difficult for most people to do. But we have to evolve a kind of debate um, that allows us to have a wisdom mind and a compassion mind and very practical, skillful means to come together, right? Many people are wondering what to do uh, going forward in a world where we're having uh, increasing amounts of fascism, increasing amounts of uh, hatred, increasing amounts of uh, political ideology, along with, of course, uh, new uh, viruses and diseases and environmental degradation. What are we going to do? Well, we can do practical things. We can uh, ride our bicycles more. We can eat less meat. We can uh, drink less alcohol. We can use less resources. But primarily, uh, as Buddhists, um, we dialogue, right? We, we speak with others. We uh, actually not just yell at them <laughs> we actually dialogue like well if that was true with what you're saying here's what your consequences would be and here's what i'm proposing and here's what the consequences would be and tell me about your consequences and your premises and how you got to where your consequences how you got to your thing so uh that is very important as skillful means for a buddhist of the 21st uh, century as I've mentioned a number of times, as everyone knows, uh, a very famous uh, Gatha poem from the Buddha, which says, the Buddhas do not um, heal by laying on of hands. The Buddhas do not wash away sins with water. Uh, the Buddhas do not uh, transfer um, their realizations. They, the Buddhas teach. So when you say teach, teach doesn't mean like, preaching at someone until they um, <laughs> are converted or preaching at someone until they are uh, you know, forcing someone. It means actually having a dialogue. So when we read uh, the sutras, they're all in dialogue form, right? So even the heart sutra that we just read is dialogue form. So uh, how do we dialogue with others? This is why we're doing the debate. I think it's very difficult to dialogue with people that um, around present circumstances, right? So um, when we have different values, different um, worldviews, different uh, political things, when you're saying, okay, I don't know how to talk to this person because they're, they're you know, uh, what do they call their proud boys or something, right? I mean, what do you say? So uh, it's very difficult to um, develop a very strong centered practice with a compassionate view, uh, correct view of the nature of mind, and say, you know, I'm willing to work with people or dialogue with people uh, uh, to help create a sense of harmony and better world and uh, do it skillfully. So it isn't just like, um, uh, was it last Tuesday, the debates? Anybody watch the debates? I watched the debates. <laughs> okay. Uh, I had to do at least, um, I think I did at least 20 rounds of Vajrasattva after watching the debates, <laughs> plus shower. Then I had to put on some like uh, opera or something. <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm putting on like Mozart or something and crank it up, you know, and <laughs> <laughs> So that's 
that's not the kind of debating we're talking about, right? We're, we're talking about actually, is it possible to uh, create a situation where people um, can actually exchange views and look at uh, things uh, and get to some truth uh, like that? Uh, there are times where I'm discouraged and I'm thinking, well, um, why bother, <laughs> you know, why talk to anybody that, you know, you know, is on the other side, uh, won't do any good because they made up their mind, We, you know, but uh, yet um, we still uh, probably end up having to work together anyway. Even if there's a civil war, you end up having to kind of go, well, okay, there's, we already had it one civil war, right? 100, 150 years ago, then you have to go back and talk with people. Isn't that right? So uh, the point uh, is uh, doing uh, the practice here at Lions Roar isn't um, ultimately become, have some badge like I'm Buddhist or I'm doing Mahamudra or Chan or I'm uh, Bodhisattva. It's to actually uh, have some uh, real intelligent uh, freedom and impact on the world. Don't you agree? Like that. So uh, to do that, um, we have to have what I'm calling a Mahasiddha practice, which is uh, the, the willingness to learn and uh, use uh, all the teachings um, all at once. If we're in a very desperate situation, uh, some of us here have been, been in the Paradise Fire in the past or something, uh, you have to uh, leave your house all at once, right? Isn't that so? You can't say, well, uh, we'll leave it a little bit and see how that goes. <laughs> Maybe some people did, right? And then that's dangerous. So if things are really um, difficult, then you have to like leave it all at once. From tantric point of view, like when we're uh, embodied uh, Buddhas, um, we, we go all at once. It's not like first your arm goes and then <laughs> your elbow, like you're going all at once. From tantric point of view, time is moving forward all at once. It's not like this, um, uh, it's linear and time is passing you by, right? We are time, we're being time. So it's, it's moving all at once. This is mandala principle, this is tantric idea, so chen idea, it's happening all at once. So uh, for a point of explanation, for a point of uh, detail, we can break the practice down into like, well, now I'm doing this, now I'm doing that, and so forth. But uh, ultimately, uh, we're doing it all at once. Isn't that so? What do you think? So we should have um, some discussion. But uh, I wanted to say a few more things about heroin, heroin's journey. <clears throat> I don't agree with everything Joseph Campbell said, so um, uh, I should say, yes, he was a privileged white male who missed some things, right? But um, taught at Sarah Lawrence College in uh, um, Bronxville, New York, where I was born, interesting. So uh, a nice uh, suburb of New York City, right, with a nice college. So he had the luxury of, um, teaching a very exclusive uh, private school, right? Uh, we don't have that luxury, we're in the world. But the hero and the heroine, uh, generally in, in that model, uh, are find themselves in an ordinary world that is then uh, upset by either an inner event, an inner calling, or an outer event that needs their response. So uh, it's somewhat like an Alfred Hitchcock movie. Alfred Hitchcock's movie generally started out like it looks very normal, right? Ordinary. <laughs> and then you realize that, you know, something has gone wrong. You know, like uh, one of my favorite movies, like uh, North by Northwest with uh, Cary Grant. He's just advertising exec, just the normal superficial guy who's mistaken for the wrong person, right? Or if, you're happen, if your favorite movie happens to be Life of Brian, <laughs> Monty Python or something, then 
that 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 starts a journey like you go well um i didn't want to do this actually with most hero and heroine journey you know i didn't want to do this but uh, something happens either inside or outside <coughs> and we have a calling and the first part of the journey um, entails gathering allies, but also gathering obstacles. So I tell many people on the path, if you're doing the practice correctly, the training, even just the training is the formal yoga, is the practice is your relationships, right? Then guess what's going to happen? You're going to reach obstacles. Yeah. So <laughs> it will, you will see more dust more uh, furniture out of order when we turn on the lights. So the biggest problem and the beginning part of the journey is uh, on some level, it feels like things are getting worse, doesn't it? If things are continually getting better in your meditation and you're always going, it's, this is great, I'm getting wiser and more mellow and everything's great. Um, I'll say, thank you very much, that's great but probably you haven't gone that deep yet, you know, because you will hit hard pan at some point. Uh, if someone's uh, a Dharma student and uh, they're still kind of uh, skating along on the surface, I'll just ask them to do some task at the temple or some task in their life where they have to engage with others or they have to do something uh, that requires them to come from a different place, and then they will reach an obstacle. So in the hero and heroine's journey, or heroine and hero's journey, we, we must have the obstacles because these are developmental steps. We must have them. We cannot say, okay, I'll just do the training and practice correctly, be the perfect meditator, perfect bodhisattva, and that way I'll avoid all the stuff. I know the texts say it that way, but the formal texts from India and Tibet and China, or wherever, are kind of like looking at, uh, you know, going to Google Maps is just going to say, this is the perfect way to get there. If you may have a special app that says, this is where the accidents are, right? But generally, it's just going to say, this is how to get there. It's not going to talk about the obstacles, except in a very general way. Isn't that so? There's no way to avoid the obstacles. We have to come. Uh, to uh, confrontation with ourself. And uh, the confrontations uh, generally uh, are only talked about in biographies. Sometimes in sutras, um, one of the confrontations we talk about that's in a sutra uh, is uh, by, uh, about a bodhisattva called Ever Weeping, Sada Prarudita. So Sada Prarudita is in a number of different sutras has uh, a person that has a deep longing for the Prajnaparamita, the wisdom mind, um, and uh, has an, an incredible longing that uh, uh, he and she is uh, uh, crying all the time or has this deep sense of longing and at times discouragement and at times, you know, just breaking down kind of, I can't do it. So when we want something really badly, we also experience how difficult it is to get there, right? So uh, we've made uh, a small meditation garden uh, outside uh, in the temple garden that uh, we may be able to visit afterwards. Epitomizing like, you know, sometimes you, do, you know, you do just feel like, oh my God, it's just too much, you know? Um, particularly right now, right? Not only in our training perhaps, but in the outer world. So as, uh, people on the journey, on the Shambhala journey or heroin hero's journey, then we're, we're going to feel at times like just overwhelmed. It's too much, right? So what do we do when we feel like it's too much? That's, you're going to ask some uh, questions or comments based on that. So I'm priming you. So you have five minutes to think about it. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, the first part of this um uh journey is you're you're getting allies you're getting techniques you're getting friends but you're also encountering um difficulties and obstacles one of the biggest obstacles and uh, uh 
or transitions, I should say, is what um, Campbell called a threshold experience. Threshold experience is when you actually uh, have to uh, cross over into another dimension, or you have to make a major choice where your orientation, your approach uh, has to be radically different to take the next step. So uh, uh, I'll give you a fancy um, Jungian word. It's called liminal. A liminal experience is a threshold experience where you've kind of left your port, so to speak, uh, but you haven't reached the other port. You're out in the ocean, out to sea, right? That's a phrase, right? I'm out to sea sometimes. Maybe you don't say that so much anymore. My parents would say a lot, well, we're out to sea on this. You know? So we've left a familiar territory, but we haven't reached the destination yet. Uh, in Tibetan, it's sometimes called a, a bardo. Bardo, the in-between, right? That's a threshold experience, really, where we, we kind of know what might happen, but we really don't know what hap might happen. Big threshold experiences are uh, like a leap, like a real leap. So uh, sometimes we say in Dzogchen is uh, cutting through or breakthrough, and then uh, the second part is leap. Because there's uh, a leap you need to make, but uh, you're not exactly sure if you can make it. And you may not even quite see the destination. That's a very deep liminal experience, right? So uh, the transition from ordinary view, like I'm just a regular person, I've just been trying to be a good person, good in my life, to realizing that your identity uh, fundamentally has to change if you want to be happy, uh, that you have to make some fundamental changes in your world would be a threshold experience. And generally, um, it's nice if we have a mentor or a guide or an ally or fairy godmother to uh, help us through that liminal experience. Um, in the 60s and the 70s and maybe coming back, you know, a lot of people are still doing, um, you know, shrooms and psilocybin, everything, peyote, uh, ayahuasca, they're trying to, uh, or alcohol or anything, they're trying to create this liminal experience so that they they have a transition to uh, you know more profound experience. I've never seen it in anybody. I've never seen it in myself. I'm still open. If people say I'm doing ayahuasca or I'm doing this, I go, well, okay, tell me, you know, or 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 shrooms or whatever, LSD. I'm telling, okay, so um, you know, tell me about yourself. Tell me what's changed. And then they tell me a lot of different experiences, visions, but it has not been a threshold experience. Why? Because they're just the same person. The same person. Well, I, I had a lot of different experiences. So I said, who are you now? And then they go, I'm me. So there's no difference, right? So that would be a place of discussion. Maybe somebody can say, Okay, I I used uh, art, you know these means to have a liminal experience to get through that threshold. Um, so I'd like to hear about it. I'm not close on that. It's just I haven't ever encountered that in 50 years, 60 years. So, but uh, we have our own way, uh, very special means in uh, tantra of um, negotiating the threshold experience and. Uh, that's a, a further talk because now it's uh, 11.50. We'd like some um, uh, discussion, yeah. Is that okay? Can we do discussion? I don't know, how do we do it now? <clears throat> Pardon me? Pass a mic to them? You can carry the mic to them? I don't know. Or someone uh, in the Samboga Kaya. The Samboga Kaya is, uh, you know, all of you who are coming in uh, remotely are in the Samboga Kaya.
to hold it, but um, when, when you're speaking about a threshold experience, would that be something we, we would um, encounter at the moment of death in the clear light mind going into the bar part of? Yeah, that's a good time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good time. <laughs> um, but, um, uh, sometimes people can really um, negotiate that and that becomes an opening experience without any uh, particular training or knowledge of the experience. There just happens. Um, but one of the interesting parts about yoga and about, um, you know, uh, lineage experiences is knowledge is passed on about how to do that, right? Uh, sometimes I use the term lineage. Lineage doesn't mean necessary uh, hierarchical temple structure. It means like how has that, how has the meditational wisdom been passed on? And usually uh, things are, have to be passed on orally. You have to hear it from someone else. Like how did you get through that experience? How did you get through that death of your child? How did you get through that change in your consciousness? How did you get through, um, you know, living in America, you know, at this time? So uh, it helps to have uh, actual um, rule of thumb experience. And that's what we're hoping to teach you. So. Let's see how long Connor can keep <laughs> doing very well. Okay, yeah, Karen. Um, you, you said that at, in the at threshold experience that then we have to leap. Do you really, is it like, if I'm thinking about leaping, I'm thinking, is it falling? Is it leaping psychologically or is it just continuing to move forward? What do you mean by that? Uh, that's a good question. I don't think it's it, uh, liminal experiences or threshold experiences are not always leaps. That could be a leap, right? That's Leaps are sometimes the most difficult, you know, because you're kind of uh, stepping off a cliff kind of thing, you know, <laughs> like the fool in the tarot, you know, just kind of like, la, la, you know, or something like that. So uh, most, many threshold experiences uh, are going to be slower and, um, not not as abrupt, right? We're we're going to uh, be confused by the fact that things are happening slower than we thought. The transformations we want them to be faster and just like get it over with. But um, many threshold experiences are. Thank you, Connor. Yeah. So many threshold experiences are like. Um, you know, growing plants or growing people or growing animals, you know, so they're, they're changing over time. Uh, so, uh, you know, my mother used to say, um, when, once she'd figured out what stage we kids were in, you know, gotten a handle on her <laughs> discipline style, we'd change, right? So that's, uh, that's like a liminal threshold. We think we have it figured out and then it changes. So that's why um, in Buddha Dharma, uh, we emphasize uh, both the positive and negative side of impermanence. Things are in constant transformation. We think we should be able to nail it down. We should be able to kind of like, okay, I got it. Um, but uh, from Buddhist point of view, we could say uh, it's just one big bardo like that. Would this be an example of a threshold experience? Um, just to, to sort of bring it contemporary, if somebody who is like me, um, white and like pretty privileged and educated and yada yada, and through readings and just all sorts of different exposures to things that I haven't ordinarily been exposed to, I begin to recognize that, oh my God, I'm actually racist. I didn't know that I was because I didn't know what that was. So my ordinary self that I thought was my ordinary self was like different than I thought. And then you start doing the work that it takes to understand it and to change. Is that an example? 
yeah, that would be an example, you know, uh, kind of arriving at some kind of conclusion might be you've arrived at the other shore, so to speak, but understanding like, well, something's happening and my normal way of looking at things, my normal identity doesn't seem tenable anymore. And I realize that I'm turning into somebody um, that, um, you know, I didn't expect it's going to be very liminal like that. So uh, that that would be a long transition, right? And of course, in uh, Buddha Dharma, uh, the big liminal experiences are we're drastically changing our view of phenomena, view of self, and ultimately view of mind. Unfortunately, when people are going through these experiences, they aren't always pleasant, right? They're unpleasant truths, aren't there? So I don't know. If we, finding out you're racist would be a truth. Uh, we all are to a degree, could be an unpleasant truth, right? <laughs> but Mama? It's certainly yeah. unpleasant, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So well, Mama, I, I have... Yeah, go ahead. Uh, sorry, Mama, Sasha. Um, hi. So, hi, so um, the experience of the last year of going through cancer treatment has felt like a very liminal experience because I've been required to change almost every aspect of how I live. Um, and in the process of going through physically being taken down below baseline and like your energy level and your capacity to who, be who you are changes, there are these, these things that come up where you see the world in a different way and you see other people in a different way. Um, so you develop things that you did not see before, like how people, like let's say if someone's disabled, how they function, how much energy they have, how they, they navigate the world. Like I've been quote unquote temporarily disabled, um, but I don't feel disabled. I just am coping with the world differently. And so the perspective of how people function with um, medical changes has been huge so i feel like i've been walking through i don't know how this relates you can tell me how this relates but i feel like i've been walking through um like gates or thresholds as you're talking about them where um you have a new experience and it completely changes your perspective but it's permanent it's not like um you can go back you can't go back once you see it yeah that's a good point you know so uh, are kind of reaching the other shore. We use that term in Paramita is going to the other shore, right? President Paramita is like, th there's, uh, uh, there's no way you can see, you know, go back to a, a previous view on it. You've seen too much, right? So, uh, you know, that's uh, a very important aspect. Like, uh, it, you're, it, it isn't... Um, you just can't go backwards. You're you're now you're now awoken to that situation. So the you know definitely any uh, profound illness is going to be very liminal, and uh, it is doubly profound if we're able to uh, find some rest in a, a new sense of journey, right? Does that make Thank sense you. or not? Yeah. Yes, makes complete sense. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I don't always make sense, so I have to ask. <laughs> yeah. I have a question, Lon. Yes. Thank you for the talk today. This is a really interesting subject to me, um, and I'm sure everyone else with us. Um, what are some of the tools to use to help redirect the confused mind and the deluded mind when it wants to be on a journey but isn't or wants to see something that isn't there or is having difficulty feeling the ground in that experience um definitely thinking about interdependence so uh was you know checking in so uh uh 
I had a lot of uh, help from uh, Taruko this week. Uh, hope she's listening. So uh, I had Geshe asked me to meet with um, a Mongolian woman uh, about some issue, and uh, when I'm talking to Geshe over the phone, I, I'm uh, I don't always get the full thing, so I wasn't like I don't know. This is a teenager or older person or whatever. So she was very gracious and said, I'm, I'm going to sit with you and uh, be present and take notes and be a second year, you know, like that. Uh, so it was kind of a Lama meaning that I was very helpful because then um, you can kind of uh, staff it afterwards. Like, what did you see? Or did you hear what she said? Or uh, it's just helpful having safety in the room too, right? So um, uh, one of the most important things is to... Um, you know, check with someone else, right? Which is kind of a natural thing kids do. You know, we, we're sitting in class and we lean over and go, did you, did you hear, like, <laughs> did the teacher say this? Or, you know, like, we're, we're um, one of the truth functions is to this consensual reality, right? This, that's conventional reality. Like, we're both thinking, are we both thinking the same thing? Did you hear the same thing, you know? Uh, did I get that right in my nuts? You know, uh, it's not a foolproof thing because then you can have like a complete filet ado, right? You know, someone disagrees with your delusion, but uh, it's really important. Uh, it was one of the first initial things, of course, is to check. I think you just got muted there, Lama anything i promise you guys can't mute llama thank you <laughs> someone got tired of me <laughs> so, uh, yeah so uh we we want to check with authority like sometimes scripture we want to check with other people we want to check our own experience again we want to check with others and uh um you know, so that, that's called, sometimes they call it four legs of the table, right? So we're checking our own experience, we're checking with someone we trust, or checking scripture, or the basic thing, of course, uh, is does this make any sense? Is it common sense? So that's one thing uh, I like about um, the Mandamican kind of style, uh, consequence school is like, oh, finally it comes down to like, does this agree with, you know, conventional consensual reality? Let's just check it against that, you know? Let's just see where it fits in. So uh, that, that, that can mean uh, that we're making sense, or at least when we're checking in with conventional reality, it would mean that maybe uh, others can hear us. So when teaching Dharma, uh, we acknowledge all kinds of different liminal states and um, uh, states and beings from other realms and all this other kind of interesting stuff. Uh, but uh, it's always good to, uh, you know, as therapists, you know, it's like, let's, are you oriented times three, right? <laughs> you know what I mean, James? You know, so, uh, you know, where you are, what time of day it is, and, you know, things like that. So are you already, are you, do you also have your feet in ordinary reality like that? So I better not say any more at this point. I'll just repeat myself. And if I'm not making sense, then it, it makes it doubly worse, don't you think? Thank you, very clear. Yeah, thank you. So let's see what time. A little after 12, maybe one more question. Heather, yeah, good. Heather's had her arm up like this, like a yogi. My question is, I think that throughout my life, I've forced a lot of liminal situations because I'm not satisfied with uh, whatever situation I may be in, is that just like escaping? Yeah. Or is there something good about any of that? Does that make sense? Uh, 
Yeah, good. Okay. The, the question I heard was, uh, lots of times I've forced these transitional threshold liminal experiences. Yeah. Um, usually it backfires, honestly. <laughs> so, uh, there, you know, sometimes when we, you know, we, we use a lot of kind of a little force, then, uh, uh, it, it can work for sure. I'm not saying it doesn't work. The thing sometimes with force is um, you you override it, you know, like that. So, which is what's happening mostly in daily life. So people go, why 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 don't I just see my Buddha needs? Why am I just happy and free? And, I, and basically, it's because you're going too fast. You're forcing it, you know, and that's really hard to slow down and kind of like. Loosen the grip, you know? So, uh, as when we're in that kind of white knuckle place, things are scary, PTSD, everything is kind of like, I mean, if someone's asking us to loosen our grip, we're saying, I'm just gonna fall. So, uh, a lot of times, and particularly this culture now, everyone is really angry and very tight. So, I don't wanna loosen up in the sense of let go into the pit, but, um, finding just the right balance. You know, the Buddha said, don't uh, tighten too much the guitar string or too loose. Um, but there are times to be assertive and, and, and nail it for sure. You know, it's just like, if you say, I'm gonna force the situation, um, are you ready to live with the consequences if it blows up? And a lot of times people aren't. We'll just say, well, I'll deal with it when it blows up. No, you won't. That's <laughs> That's the alcoholic addict talking, right? You know, I'll just wait till it blows up. And, you know, it really means someone else will deal with it. So once in a while, you know, we, we do have to take chances or leaps. And we don't know, you know. So uh, we, we take a guess. But still, could you live with it? Yeah, that was a good question. <clears throat> yeah. So, uh I really appreciate people um, watching uh, and people here. I think this will be how we'll do things for a couple of months anyway and uh, see how it goes, right? Um, I don't know why. Oh my, I'm, I'm in this liminal space myself, so I find my internal world is like, I'm going to wait until and see what happens after the election. <laughs> you know, I was like, uh, you know, and then I can breathe out uh, but uh you know still we have to do things and here we're, we're probably going to continue as long as okay with governor to uh have uh probably maximum 20 people 25 people and then also do uh um uh google you know at the same time so uh I think I'm hoping it was useful for people at home and uh, useful for people here. So I uh, appreciate people coming and sitting and having wearing masks and um, uh, doing that Bodhisattva activity like that. And um, uh, <laughs> I, I, I hope Dirk doesn't mind if I shout him. I think you're wearing a mask in, in, your, in front of your own camera. Is that right? I'm wearing my mask because I'm wearing it in solidarity with the people in the temple wearing their masks. All right. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank you. That's what he thought was here. So, yeah. So, final word is that, you know, the uh, can we have enough uh, presence of mind to speak uh, truth to power, right? Are we actually able, able to have a dialogue uh, with enemies, right? That's hard practice, right? Very hard practice. So I think uh, with the proper training and teachings, um, you know, I would say, uh, well, I'm just quoting my teacher who would go, it's fairly easy to realize the nature of mind. It's really hard to dialogue with your enemy. What do you think? Isn't that so? It's really easy to realize the nature of mind. It's really hard to love unlovable people. Yeah. It's really hard to, you know, work with these really difficult problems. It's really hard to maintain a sense of aspiration when 
we know the ice caps are shrinking, right? You know, when we know things are difficult, we're not going to, it's not suddenly going to like turn around, right? So uh, seeing nature mind, seeing nature compassion is, is essential so that we're able to actually be effective, yeah? So, you know, thank you everybody for uh, uh, being here in the Nirmanakaya, in the Sabogakaya, and if you're dwelling in the Dharmakaya too, that's really great. I think you all are actually. So let's end here, right? So do, uh, let's do dedication. I do tweet to the president fairly often, truth to power. <laughs> he doesn't respond. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by the snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chinrezi, Tenzin Jatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Losang, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion. Manju Shri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras. Sonkapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Losang Drakpa, I make request at your holy feet. Now I'll mute myself. Thank you very much, Lama. I think it would be just uh, uh good like also i hate to uh add extra things as it takes time but um uh i wanted people to learn gurum shay's seven line prayer so we should have that in the book at least that doesn't take very long does it so along with our regular prayer. oh we don't have to do it now but you know next next time we we can add that that would be uh a good idea don't you think yeah. So uh, there are various translations of seven line prayer. Derek, why don't you send me your favorite one? Please, would that be possible? Sure. Uh, so, so do you want to do when we do the seven line prayer to do it in English then? Uh, I think it's good to do it in Tibetan and English, you know. So just when prayers, uh, you know, we don't want to take up too much time. We could do all prayers for an hour. So maybe we can just do once in Tibetan and once in English in the future. You know, okay. but, uh, you know so the, there, I have various uh, translations of seven line prayer. So I'd be interested to see what um, your favorite one is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we'll go from there. All righty, thank you everybody. Omahang, ciao. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lama. And thank you, Dirk. <laughs>